Now we are live. Ahoy there, Avast, and other such maritime sayings. My name is Matthew Dawkins. You probably know that because you're on my channel, not the Onyx Path channel. Apologies for that. I know you're never supposed to start a presentation with an apology, but we did advertise this would be on the Onyx Path YouTube channel due to a technical snafu in the last 10 minutes before we went live. We had to migrate over to my channel, and hopefully you found this link. Uh, now, this opening will make no sense after I've downloaded this video and put it on the Onyx Path channel, but just know that when this was going out live, it was bedlam. And now we've uh, we've managed to stabilize the situation. The submarine has righted itself. The Gilfolk have been driven off, and we are broadcasting live and in living color to all of you across the world. Uh, and saying that, here's the second apology. Time zones. We know that this is being broadcast at an inconvenient time for most of you good folk in America, especially you good folk in America who have supported this Kickstarter so far. We very much appreciate your patronage, and uh, you can still engage with us in the comments below. I'll still respond to your questions. Engage with us on the Kickstarter in the comments, and just generally hit us up on social media. We're all there. So I'm going to be mostly acting as moderator, in this q a but before i do before i start checking out your questions let's introduce the panelists you have myself very rudely introduced myself developer of the game matthew dawkins i came up with the concept for they came from beneath the sea but i also hired writers because like this isn't a one man or one person job one of those writers down in a box below me right now is uh, larry blameyer so Larry, how about introduce yourself? What what are your credentials? Thank you. Um, well, I, uh, I I I don't want to reveal my credentials, in public, <laughs> but however, I will tell you that I uh, am an artist and writer and uh, filmmaker. Um, I guess I'm known f mostly for the Lost Skeleton of Cadavera, uh, which has become a cult film. Um, and uh, and Dark and Stormy Night and Trail of the Screaming Forehead and a few others and um, and I'm also a playwright and uh, other things and I've and I've been a science fiction illustrator for a long time and uh, and there you go in a nutshell and I mean and, and this is your first foray into the world of tabletop RPGs. I am a complete and utter newbie and I was at the beginning of this process which has been very enjoyable. And I am still at the end of this process, but I will get it. <laughs> and we also have Bianca Savazzi, uh, who hasn't been on one of these streams before. Bianca, who the hell are you? Hi. Um, so I this is also my first tabletop, actually. So I um, usually work with digital games instead, as a games designer, but more specialized in the technical aspects. But then I met Matthew. And uh, he invited me to write on this project, so I'm really excited. Yeah, Bianca and I, our introduction to each other was working on a video game that can't be named. Um, we both uh, worked at uh, Paradox Interactive briefly. Oh, I worked there briefly. She worked there for longer than that. And uh, yeah, uh, through getting to know Bianca, I knew she would have a mind for this kind of thing. And sure enough, she delivered some of the best content on the book, not to downplay the, the contributions of you other writers here in this room uh, or to embarrass her. But uh, Bianca is uh, someone whose name you'll see recurring through Onyx Path books coming out in the next uh, year or so, because, well, and hopefully beyond that, because I've hired her uh, several times and other developers have started to do so as well. And then we have a familiar face on my channel. You can't get rid of him. He's the barnacle of the tabletop RPG industry now, Mr. John Burke. Like a bad smell wafting back into your lives. Um, yeah, I am also completely unqualified. Uh, this was actually my first RPG project, um, but not anymore. Um, so I'm very excited to see it come to fruition um, because... I think in comparison to other stuff I've done, this is the, the only one, if you want, that was never tried before. It was completely uncharted and essentially we could do whatever the hell we wanted with it. So a lot of fun and I hope everyone else has fun with it as I did writing it and as I'm sure everyone else did. 
Yeah, it's um, quite telling. This game, we start, started working on it over a year ago, probably, I guess, a year and a half ago, maybe. Um, that's when pen hit paper, or at least type hit Microsoft Word. And it goes to show the length that the development process on a book can take, especially when it's a brand new game. Uh, we used the story path system, which is uh, familiar to anyone who knows the game Scion, Trinity, uh, Dystopia Rising uh, as Onyx Path. It's a proprietary system. We've uh, made it up and it fit this game very well. But we had to come up with a world. We had to come up with a setting, uh, with monsters, with a reason for its existence. And over the uh, year and a half of writing, of editing, of development, and now, of course, uh, leaning into the art stage and the Kickstarter, uh, a game can take a while to reach this point, but I'm very glad that it has taken this long. One of the things the writers haven't been exposed to as much, although they have uh, ran the game in, in some cases, is the amount of playtesting that went into this. Um, some people who will have heard interviews with me about They Came From Beneath the Sea will know that this game was first play tested around 10 years ago in a very different iteration. It was still They Came From Beneath the Sea, but it was more uh, private military companies and very dangerous, serious aquatic threats. And you were at war with the corporations as much as you were against those bastards from beneath the sea who were just like a third party in what was ultimately a big capitalist war. And the they came from beneath the sea that we have now is very much not that. Uh, it's uh, far more fanciful, farcical, and very much in the mode of 1950s and 1960s uh, science fiction. Uh, something we've also been discovering a lot lately, as anyone who is going to tune into the uh, Red Moon role-playing actual play of this game will find, is that they came from is eminently adaptable to be horrific. Uh, the We've discussed loosely the idea of doing a Hammer Horror version. They came from beyond midnight with, you know, a genuine Wolfman, Dracula, and the like, and you could have a Goosebumps, uh, R.L. Stein, or Point Horror. They came from beneath my bed. If you wanted to go down the sort of teen horror or young adult horror route, point being, what we discovered as this game went through play tests and iterations was how expansive this system and the basic setting can be. Now, it's done remarkably well on Kickstarter. And I say remarkably well because it's always a risk when you launch a brand new game, especially over Christmas, which tends to be a rather dead period on Kickstarter, you don't know how quickly you're going to fund or how well you're going to fund. We managed to fund this game in two days. A lot of that is down to the good faith that Onyx Path Publishing already have from backers who support our games through thick and thin, and we're very grateful for that. But what we've seen is a constant uptick in backers, and that's remarkable, not only because it was in December and January, but because this is a new property. It seems to have grabbed an audience and made them interested in it. And we're seeing that through the number of actual plays that have already gone up on YouTube, on podcasts. People are taking the manuscript without the art and they're playing the game straight from the text and what little art they can see on the Kickstarter. And that's, that's amazing. That's stunning to see people playing a game from the words alone. They're not needing anything other than their imaginations to set the game in motion. That And that's it's gratifying to all of us, and especially gratifying to me, uh, being able to the ideas translated to words and words like back into ideas is, is glorious. It's a glorious feeling. So with all of my harping on done, I think I should open this up to viewer questions in a minute, unless, actually, you know what, before I do, I'm going to uh, go back to Larry. Because Larry, as we said, this is your first experience on a role-playing mm. game. Perhaps you could tell the audience what you wrote. You don't need to break it down in minute detail, but what you wrote for the game. Well, I had uh, the initial thing that I wrote was 10 fiction pieces, um, which really appealed to me. Um, and I should mention that there was, I found that I don't, I don't know really anything about role playing games. And um, so it was, it was new to me in that respect. 
but what wasn't was the old the sci-fi and and horror and and fantasy films and um uh, uh in particular the ones from the 50s uh the, those sci-fi films which i love and so i had that i knew that and and that's what why the, the writing the fiction was very appealing because um these 10 pieces i approached it like i was writing uh, um, a tiny movie with a tiny budget and well actually no not a tiny budget it could be anything but it, it had to be tiny. There was a, a restriction of how long it could be. But I tried to make one, each one of them like a, a concise and complete B movie. Um, and, and that was really fun. And, 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 and of course, the challenge was also uh, how many aquatic monsters can you come up with? And I, I, I think we, from this whole team, it's an amazing amount of aquatic monsters uh, and, and aliens and underground civilizations and such. So I wanted, so the 10 pieces, the fiction pieces had a variety to them. There's a, you know, there's a, a lame underground um, civilization. Uh, there's um, uh, that that's trying to flood the earth and, uh, uh, you know, the, the land people. And of course, and then there's teenage shrimp, which is a, um, uh, a disgruntled uh, 1950s teen who, uh, because of radiation, that's never happened before, uh, becomes a giant uh, shrimp uh, monster. And, um, um, and and so you've got a range of stuff. And that variety was really fun. That was very appealing to me. That was the first thing that I did. And I didn't need to know, doing the fiction, I didn't need to know any of the mechanics. Later on, I needed to, there was a bit of a learning curve to, to learn the mechanics, some of them. And, uh, well, I know well, and, and this is always uh, something. I guess, given that this is your first foray into this world, it does it feel at all odd that then people have used those ideas and played with them at a tabletop, and basically, you know, they've taken your uh, teenage shrimp nylon tines and they've basically given him a voice in their game. Wait a second, you didn't tell me about that. Um, oh yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. That uh, 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 that I, I find really cool. That you're sort of providing the clay for for people to uh, mold in, in in any which way they want, and that's that's completely different from anything I've done. But I I, I think that's really cool. And uh, John, what did you write for the game? Um, my main focus was on the threat section, I guess. So I wrote an awful lot of bizarre aquatic threats, um, one of which was Larry's Centipus, um, which I found hilarious. I, I really enjoyed writing that just because it was it was able to be kind of turned into uh, almost a standalone quest kind of on its own, being the size that it is. Um, I also contributed to the stunt section. I wrote quite a few of those um, and some of the cinematics as well. So it was a, a nice mixture between, um, I suppose, as a start, the biographies, if you want, of these aliens, um, and also trying to come up with interesting and cool mechanics with the stunts and the cinematics, especially with it being something I wasn't entirely familiar with. I don't, I don't think I've ever had an experience of a game before where it's like, you know, you, you could be ST in this and, and one of your players turns around and goes, no, that didn't happen. This happens instead and stuff like that. So I, I found that quite quite fun where it's like, yeah, you can sort of meta game, but in a, an interesting and cool way that makes the story much more collaborative. And uh, Bianca, what was your contribution to the book? So I was also writing a bunch of threats. For me, it was like the mechanics of it um, were really interesting. It's very different from what I'm used to, like fine tuning economy or guns. <laughs> so it was definitely something new, but I had a lot of fun with it. So. I think uh, you all, did you also, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, did you also have some of the uh, system, some of the abilities maybe, and attributes? Mm, only for normal. I, I, could, I could be incorrect on this one, but no, I know you contributed uh, a lot of the threats, and so did John, um, and there was, I certainly had the intent on this book that every writer would contribute at least one monster it it's a book that comes with its own monster manual built in uh but which threat are you proudest of bianca oh um 
to be honest, it probably has to be like the the pill bugs, just because of how silly they are. Because then it was pretty much just going like full out on like, okay, well they like making puns, so they're a bit of the like hi ho characters. Um, but the one that probably I think is the coolest one has to be the brain eaters. So yeah, uh, pun, yeah, the brain pun. eaters. <laughs> I have not seen a creature used as much in people's actual plays and um, and in play tests run at conventions than the brain eater eels because I think everyone has that fear of invasion of the body snatchers horror. It fits in very well with that Cold War invasion, you know, pernicious invader uh, myth. And uh, yeah, the fact that they're eels coming up through the drain pipe works very well. <laughs> Yeah, but that, I think that's one of the really fun things about the like setting that we're working on, because you kind of notice a bit that it's like you know fifty years past, and then something starts to become popular again. So we have all of these like monster movies, but also like the comic book stuff, a bit like fifty years ago, are now like super popular again. So I'm just waiting for B movies to to come in. Well, you need to look no further than Larry, I guess. <laughs> When's your next movie? Yeah, well, we need more. We need more. <laughs> well, one of the other things Larry contributed that uh, we've not discussed yet, and uh, it's one of the, I guess, prevailing gimmicks of the game is the quips, the, uh, the one-liners that your characters can utter oh. that can uh, change the course of a narrative because at just at that crucial moment, you're about to sock a lobster man in the face, uh, or you're about to clean a brainy to eel's clock, and at that point, you utter a quip, and they've been very popular as well. Uh, was, it, uh, was, it, uh, was it a fun or trying experience to come up with something like, what it, was it, 50, it was, maybe even 100 quips, I think, in this book? It, it was a lot, and it was mostly fun. The only, uh, the trick is to not, repeat yourself too much. Um, uh, there's a lot of them that is sort of the dry, you know, the the dry comment, the dry kind of, um, well, I guess you'd better something or other, or, you know, before you let the monster have it kind of thing. Um, and, and so you, 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 want, um, you want cliches or you want things that are close to them and that sound like cliches, but you don't want to use all of the all of the cliches we've heard. And that was fun for me because I've sort of got a, I think a stored up memory bank of, um, of uh, that kind of movie dialogue. And it's always kind of uh, been a fun thing for me. Um, yeah, that was a lot of fun. So uh, yeah, those, uh, those quips will be available on individual cards that come out with the, uh, with the game. You can buy them separately, or I don't think we've hit the stretch goal target yet, but you'll be able to order the deck with the, um, with the book. Just check out the Kickstarter. The link is in the description to the video, and uh, you'll be able to see through the breakdown how you get the quips and the cinematics for They Came From Beneath the Sea. And uh, John mentioned cinematics. Those are your meta powers where you, as the person running the game, uh, can suddenly lose control to the players. Players can basically say, we're going to insert a deleted scene here because we forgot to rummage through the sheriff's desk. So let's say that's what we did and they go back in time and then they do it. Or Sensipus is about to devour all of you on board a ship. So that's where you insert a missing reel. And then your characters have all got to jump forward in time, but they can't refer exactly to what happened during that missing scene. They can make vague allusions to it, but they don't know because you're the people that did it, the players, the producers, uh, the people who uh, made these characters jump forward. So you can say a line like, well, I've never seen a sailor do that with a pineapple before, but you can't actually say how Centipus was beaten, escaped or so on and those cinematics have likewise been an incredibly popular part of this game it makes it wholly different to anything else there, there are some games where meta powers are a thing but this is probably the only game i've ran where they are such an intrinsic part of how they came from plays now i said that this is a live q a 
So let, let's actually turn it over to the people who are watching this. And I can see you all because I'm on YouTube right now and watching you comment. And thank you very much for all tuning in. Uh, again, uh, this video is going to be saved. It will be uploaded to the Onyx Path YouTube channel. And if you don't get a question in right now, we will answer it future, in future. Uh, but feel free to uh, ask any questions you have what you want. Cornelius asks, we have reached the printed cards. Wonderful. So yes, you can get printed quip cards and cinematics. It was that easy while we were doing the Q&A. If we keep doing this all night, it'll be like a telethon. We'll just keep raising the bar. Uh, going to Keegan Sullivan, Lobster Reagan was what sold one of my co-workers to fund the Kickstarters. That's down to you, Larry, uh, your lobster man <laughs> breaking a flag in half, whether that was intentionally based on Ronald Reagan. <laughs> uh, he is now lobster no. Reagan. <laughs> no, uh, no, I, I, there, there have been a couple of uh, uh, suggestions that it was based on this or that person. I've heard Reagan before, but no, it was not. I basically <laughs> took um, a, a sort of a 1950s businessman looking type to start with, but then then crabbed his face. If that's mm. if that's even a verb. Well, yes, the uh, the tagline for that image is C is for communist, C is for crabs. And uh, so, if anything, this uh, this man is an anti-Reagan, uh, although this is very much pre, pre-Reaganomics. Uh, Meredith asks, question for all these amazing writer beans, uh, even if you didn't write them specifically, who is your favorite NPC, or, uh, so character or monster in They Came From Beneath the Sea and why? So I'm going to go to uh, Bianca first of because you've already mentioned the brain eater eels So of the other monsters that you've read or seen depicted in this game Which one appeals to you the most or indeed characters it may be a uh, brain eater infested Stalin uh, You're yes. muted right now. There you go. Yes, I was looking for the unmute button so I remember reading a lot about the um, the brain box, but I thought oh, that one was quite complex. <laughs> so I was like reading it and going like, "Oh, brain box, brain eater! Wow, we're we're doing lots of brain stuff, it's like mind control." Uh, th this is unplanned, but that was one of John's monsters. I think it was his first contribution <laughs> as a writer, in fact. Uh, so that not bad going, John. Your very first assignment is being acclaimed by fellow writers. It was all um, downhill from there. <laughs> yeah, you, you've never gone back to that dizzying peak. Uh, so what, what can you tell the audience about Brain Box, John? Um, it's very big. That's what I can tell you. Um, Brainbox is essentially a, a robot intelligence that lives in the sea. Um, initially, it was a a sort of strategy computer that was invented during the war, and then after the war finished, without it really having its chance to shine, uh, the government tried to get its money back by repurposing it as an advertising sort of thing. But it kept saying, "Ah, I've got a great idea for advertising. Kill everyone." Um, uh, long story short, it was kidnapped by an undersea threat, which itself has um, supposedly either done away with or enslaved um, and got it to build it an army of robots to serve its every whim. And now it's trying to retake the world from which it was banished. Um, yeah, I, I don't know how I come up with that, to be honest. Um, but... It was one of those things that once I started writing it, it was just like, just kind of fell onto the page. So mm. definitely one of the more natural things that I wrote. And um, do you have a favourite monster that appeared in the game, John, that wasn't one of yours? Blah. Hmm. You can't use Centipus because although it was Larry's invention, yeah, you, you yeah. started him up. I, I wrote that, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> probably the glowing people, um, only because I think the glowing people for me... <laughs> are like the epitome of um, a, a sci-fi villain, if you want, like this this enigmatic, mysterious mind control and thing. It, it brought up a, a vision for me of that Simpsons episode with, with Burns coming out of the, court, the cotton field, you know, like, I bring you love, you know. Um, he's bringing love, break his legs. Um, That's actually what I thought of when I was writing it. 
Yes. I'm making me laugh. <laughs> and again, again, I don't think John knew Bianca had ridden the glowing people up. So this is a big love in. This, yeah. uh, this is like a post play gather round. All the actors are saying, "Well, I loved your performance, Larry. I thought it." <laughs> Welcome to the Aren't You Wonderful podcast. Yeah. Um, no, I, I just really liked the. I just thought it was, and as I say. A very just a very B movie villain. I can just imagine him as this homogenous kind of blob drifting about. That yes, it claims to bring you peace and love, but actually brings you famine, pestilence, war, and death. So yes. And Larry, I've got a different question for you. Uh, and so because we're hoping to have you on as an artist for pieces to come on this book, but so far, what has been your favourite piece of art to create for this book? Well. It's funny because I, that was going to be my also my favorite uh, monster that I didn't come up with, which is the brain eater eels. So uh, we're just continuing to love in. It's yeah. awful, isn't it? It's just so embarrassing. But um, I, I really liked them as, a, as an illustrator. I really liked uh, them and get and having the, the setting of the 50, 1950s kitchen and um, um, and there's something very uh, very. I don't know. They were fun to paint because because you could um, have a lot of fun with the with the skin texture, and it was really kind of kind of nasty, um, which I liked. So um, so that was probably my favorite one to illustrate. My um, I I would actually go for the brain eater eels as well. Sorry, John. Um, so Bianca is the writer of the day, but uh, <laughs> it's it's because it's partly because of that art as well, and it's a very good piece of art for depicting the blue collar hero uh, ethos of the 1950s sci fi genre. That pe these people are just trying to defend their patch of land. Damn it! Don't you know they've just been through a war, and now you're throwing this at them? And so, in we in this uh, piece of art, we have a housewife, uh, probably a suburban housewife battling a brain eater eel or several brain eater eels with a rolling pin and you can picture that very scene in a sci-fi movie played completely straight and i think that's the that's the key to um, to good art and good monsters in a game like this that the players and the storyteller the director i should say can add as much humor as they feel appropriate but we need to play it as straight faced as possible I say it in pretty much every interview about this game, we can't dictate what is funny. We can't prescribe humor, but what we can do is give you the tools to make it funny if that's what you want out of it. Otherwise, yeah, play it as horrific as it actually would be if dozens of brainy eels were crawling up your drain pipe. Uh, you probably wouldn't be smiling and laughing and making quips about it, but the characters in our game are heroic sorts and, and quips is what they do. So we have some more questions. Uh, oh, we've actually we've got lots of questions. In fact, uh, Kian asks, "What's everyone's favourite B movie?" And he does specify none of Larry's. That's cheating. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to go first to allow everyone else to think, and you can repeat my answer if you so choose. Um, my one is actually uh, the Magnetic Monster. It's a 1953 movie. Uh, it's not an aquatic threat movie. It's a radiation threat movie. And it's uh, you've got some wonderful scientists in it. You've got um, a threat that gets increasingly dangerous. And it is another movie that is played completely straight. It It is obviously... Um, well away from the seriousness of something produced in the 70s or 80s that deals with atomic war or the danger of radiation. But it's interesting to see how cinema was handling that kind of fear through a science fiction lens. And the magnetic monster, which from the name doesn't seem terribly frightening, is a frightening movie uh, when looked at you know in the time it was produced in my opinion so that would be my one uh so larry what about you and you can't name one of your own no that's a terrific movie uh magnetic monster and um my uh the fans of my movies are probably sick of hearing it but it's it's got it's got it's, it's attack of the crab monsters um which 
was made for very little and ha and and has um, and has a, uh, a science in it that I can only describe as surreal, um, because the giant crabs essentially they they eat someone and then they talk like them. Not only that, they telepath the voices into people who are sleeping, get them to get up out of bed and walk towards the pit where they. And you know, I saw that as a kid, and of course, that was that was really creepy, and I so, but which I loved, um, and I still I still really love that movie. It takes a lot of flack, but I, I think it's terrific. Well, uh, so that's a good choice. I think we we have it in our uh, recommended media as well, in in the book. Um, John, what about for you? And it doesn't have to be restricted to the fifties. Uh, well, good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> although I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna have to break one of the rules because because Lost Skeleton of Cadaver is amazing. It's like a hilarious film. Um, so yeah, everyone should watch it. Pretty much, it's just fe feature featuring just one of my favourite off the cuff, completely straight faced quips ever about about the Amish terrarium, which just knocks me out every time I see it. Um, he knows what I mean, but. Um, <laughs> I think it, probably the old sort of Flash Gordon matinee style shorts used to get at the start of films. I, I used to go, to, my mum and dad used to take me to the, the movies quite a lot when I was a kid. And you would always get these little features at the start and they were never in the right order. So that you would see something that like, stuff had happened, you know, <laughs> that you'd missed four of them. So like, the one we're showing isn't the, the immediate continuation of the one we showed last week. So it was like, why is Flash got a different haircut? Like, why is it a different actor? Why, why is Ming three inches taller? Why has he got one leg? I don't know. Um, <laughs> all that stuff was quite crazy. But that kind of stuff, like me and my friends used to talk about it. Oh, you know, what, what's going on with that? Like, what's happened there? So I loved that stuff. Um, probably nowadays, I would more think of really cheesy stuff that, I don't know, I, I tend to look, look at that stuff as something that I want to just be entertained by and find kind of amusement in the, the kind of twistedness of it. Um, so like, just weird science stuff like um invasion of the bee girls um empire of the ants was quite weird with joan collins being sprayed with ant pheromones to control her um i don't know i just yeah, lost the of, only way yeah what else um but just it's, it's always I, I do think they always have this common theme running through them don't they have like something wholesome being attacked by generally something every day like ants you know or something like that and it's like ah, i see how this could be you know with, with 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 the wrong application of science it's almost like it's almost like that kind of lucasian um view of like science so in the wrong hands it can go wrong don't go too far don't, don't be a machine man you know that sort of thing um but yeah that, I'm, I'm afraid i'm afraid i still think lost skeleton just for the joviality of the skeleton uh, and uh, um, and yeah. it, it's worth noting, you know, the reason uh, I approached Larry to work on this book is because from the first time I reached this point with They Came From Beneath the Sea as a concept, I thought this matches exactly the movies of Larry Blamire. And that's The Lost Skeleton, Skeleton Returns Again, Trail of the Screaming Forehead, and even Dark and Stormy Night, which I, I rate as, uh, we're talking about him as if he's not in the room, uh, which I rate as the best one, my favourite one, fantastic movie, and although it is completely not in this genre, it is the, the quintessential humour, to my mind, for this game. And it was in the uh, required watching list for the writers to to watch uh, Larry's back catalogue because uh, that his humour matches this game. Hence, why we hired him. <laughs> uh, Bianca, uh, what about you? Uh, any any particular B movie favourites? Ooh, so it depends on how picky we're gonna be with the term B movie. So I watched most of the like old sci-fi movies on like the sci-fi channel. So I have no idea what their budgets were. It might have been like a huge budget at the time, but for me, just like uh, I'm 26 year old, so movies done <laughs> like over half of like, yeah, double my lifetime. It's just like, you think that it's gonna be a low budget, but it probably wasn't. Um, um. But from the 60s, I probably have to go with like Creature from the Black or Creature of the Black Lagoon, I think it's called. Just uh, it follows a very typical formula mm. that that's very popular now. 
but yeah it's it is the archetypal humanoid monster movie and uh, i don't think there's anything wrong with that the the obviously you have the uh, giant monster movies uh, which everyone knows with uh, Godzilla and King Kong and the like, which of course spans many decades. But Creature from the Black Lagoon is a um, is a more humanoid threat. It's more relatable, and again, it was more timely for for the era. Uh, but yeah, that is definitely a classic. And I, you know what? I don't know if we have it in the recommended reading so, or watching, so I'm going to have to check that. Um, we also have a question from Michael. Uh, the, this book is refreshing and entertaining as a breath of fresh air. I was curious as to some of the proposed follow-on books, anything in the feeling of Mars Attacks. So I'll answer this, of course. Uh, so Mars Attacks, I guess, would be the natural progression for They Came From Beneath the Sea if you wanted to set it in a late 20th century uh, very, uh, what, what would the genre be, I guess? Cynical. Uh, it would be the cynical sci-fi genre, uh, where everyone it deserves to die, uh, not, not just the aliens. Uh, there are very few innocents in Mars Attacks, uh, but I don't know that we would necessarily go there. There's so many different movie genres that could be uh, tilled for, for this game. And as I mentioned before... Um, I mean, my personal favourites, and I guess it depends on the marketability and discussions with uh, Rich Thomas on high, is um, I, I like the idea of doing a Hammer Horror one, a, a classic, a vintage horror, uh, but not so vintage, not Lugosi, not, uh, not Karloff horror, but proper Christopher Lee, a little bit of uh, rather cheap eroticism in it as well, because a lot of those hammer horrors, especially when you get into the 70s, are quite exploitative. And I like exploitation cinema. I think it has a place. Obviously, it's deeply flawed, but I, I think people came to that realization very quickly. Um, so my, my ideal would be to do a hammer horror one. Uh, the natural progression as well for the way people are playing They Came From Beneath the Sea, as well as playing it uh, for the comedy and sci-fi, is they're playing it very Lovecraftian. So they came from beyond the stars. Uh, and obviously that isn't so much of a movie genre because it's always been very difficult to translate Lovecraft into a decent film. Has been done a couple of times. A lot of people cite things like Event Horizon. Uh, and that that could quite easily be done too. Uh, the way I've been doing uh, They Came From Beyond the Stars, you still have quips, but the quips are things like guttural chants in alien languages. And they are... Um, statements like uh just don't hurt no take him just don't hurt me or this is hell or i'm staring into the face of god they're very fatalistic they're very sacrifice everyone around you kind of things and that the quips inform the tone of the game more than you'd perhaps think uh let's see who else do we have asking questions here uh, so Dale asks, "What inspired you to come up with deleted scene, just deleted scenes and the quip systems?" Well, the cinematics again, I can answer that. Although uh, we had several authors on the cinematics, and the idea was for me that if it was, I, I don't like the idea of meta plot. To so anyone who doesn't understand what meta plot is, or meta gaming, I should say, meta gaming is when you play a role playing game and the players have. Um, direct influence on what the characters know or the characters know what the players know and there's very little division between them i wanted a game where metagaming wasn't a dirty word where it wasn't a concept that shouldn't fit in and so being able to directly interfere with the plot in hopefully an entertaining way was something that appealed to me a great deal. And using various cinematic conceits, such as deleted scenes, missing scenes, redirecting damage to hit an extra rather than your character. So you're about to be zapped by a ray gun, but Angus is stood next to you. So you play the cinematic. The ray, for whatever reason, arcs or Angus jumps in front of you, compels your character to hold Angus and go, no, Angus, even if you've only just met him. But you've got things like that. You've got summoning a stuntman. So if your character is physically incapable, you summon the stuntman cinematic so that your character gets beefed up physical stats, but you have no dialogue. You can't speak. As soon as your character speaks, the stuntman role is gone. Your physical stats drop back down. You're back to who you were. 
And for me, having powers like that was something unique so they came from, and people seem to be enjoying it. In terms of quips, uh, so I'll turn back to Larry on this. Um, we actually had lots of brackets for quips. Do you, do you recall uh, anything about that? There was uh, quips for different types of characters. Yeah, in different situations. I mean, the one that popped into my head is the one it, it, a lot of people think of, which is because it's still used in movies. In the 80s, it was an explosion of these kind of things where it's the climax of the movie. Someone's about to throw a switch or light a fuse or do something and and just destroy the enemy at that point, whatever that might be. And they do it with a, a smart wise guy kind of remark and that was one that we had in, I, I i think we actually called it like just before throwing the switch or something like yeah, that I think, I think that's the subtitle um, you came up with for that section was before you flip that switch and mm -hmm. yeah then and then write 20 quips for that larry you've come up with the title and then and then there was um and then there was a science category wasn't there a uh, let me see um there was a category with uh uh Stand up about to do science or something like that. I think. Yeah, it, it was fun because I got to, got to write a bunch that were about science and um, and using uh, science, which which I had fun with in Lost Skeleton. So, um, uh, and I'm trying to remember the other uh, the other categories for quips. I know we wrote them so long ago, didn't we? It, it uh, like a long time ago. Uh -huh. uh, so the let's see the various uh, categories were um, let's see <laughs> we had uh, vows defiance and tough talk so that's your steadfast survivor quips you have quip your griping uh, we have and before you pull that switch please enjoy this great portent uh, why so glib and the flirtation quip. And the portent one is is fun because it's the um, if we don't do such and such, such and such is going to happen, uh, and and uh, uh, that's that's one you you see a lot in the older movies. Um, yeah. Uh, Jenny asks, "What was the part you enjoyed writing the most?" Uh, and I have to confess. Uh, I didn't uh, write a great deal of this game. As developer, it was my job, I guess, to massage everyone else's work. Uh, one of my f the, one of the few bits I did write was the director's chair, uh, which is a feature I've not seen many people using yet, so it will be interesting to see how many people pull this tool out of the box. It is, it is basically a mechanical effect that you can play on They Came From Beneath the Sea so that the director, being the person running the game, can be a director with a big budget, which means everything has got to be described with a lot more opulence, but perhaps less plots, um, you know, stability. Uh, there's a, likewise a shoestring budget. There's a foreign director. Um, so a lot of the plot may just make be completely disjointed and make no sense um, for the characters involved in it. And uh, that was that was fun for me. So you could also have a uh, sort of Kubrickian director who is, uh, although of course he would be spinning in his grave right now to hear him uttered in the same phrase as B-movies, but the the idea that you are consistently unhappy with the players and the way they're playing their characters, so you make every single challenge monstrously difficult for them, but they have to find a way out of it each time. Uh, on the face of it, that may not sound like fun, but as long as you remember that you're playing a role as well, and ultimately your goal is to make it entertaining, uh, I think it, each of them can, can be a lot of fun, just different ways of tailoring the game. And uh, I know I've uh, addressed that all that with all of you so far, the um, your favorite monsters to write and so on. But um, Larry, I was going to ask, of the 10 pieces of fiction you wrote, uh, did was there one that you thought immediately, I could turn this into a movie? <laughs> yeah, there were, there were a couple. There were a couple. Um, and one of them is Teenage Shrimp. Um, I think I had the most fun with that one because 
the main character and his girlfriend are very jaded and 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 they're so angst ridden in that 50s kind of way so it's kind of like shrimp without a cause you know it's really just um uh, uh i was very happy with that one and and for most of it before he becomes giant uh he's actually sort of a weir shrimp because he'll be you know he'll be in an alley and and um, and suddenly uh, uh, he starts turning into this shrimp monster and attacks some of the, the the high school football team and they don't know it's it's him for a while. Uh, so that was fun because I, I really could as I was writing that I really could see it um, as a movie. Um, and uh, yeah, there was and there was one other too, but I'm I'm totally blanking on it. what was the one with the. Um, <sighs> I don't have them in front of me. There was one other that that I thought was that, that was fairly cinematic too, uh, which had a uh, a woman who was turning into a monster, and I can't remember which one it was now. But you had the uh, the Atlantoids uh, one where there was lots of oh, and the Federal yeah. Bureau of Dams came up a couple of times. Oh, the, of Dam. of that. the Atlantoids were very Ed Wood, very Ed Wood. Mm. Yeah, um, yeah, they were fun. Um. And uh, John and Bianca, was there anything else that you uh, wrote for the book that you were particularly uh, proud of, or you want to uh, that you enjoyed writing? Well, hopefully all of it. But Bianca, uh, I just want to about that fiction of the woman because that it was fiction that I read that was about a woman who was like an electric eel. Who that was, was it. People. That's it. Yeah, that was my favorite. So I just wanted to say that. <laughs> So that's my favorite fiction of it. It was the E Electric Woman, if I recall. <laughs> Thank you. The Electric Woman, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so I thought it had a very nice e arc. So that's why I really enjoyed it. <laughs> Clearly, we all get a lot of mileage out of eels in this group. <laughs> <laughs> Who can resist them? Yeah, they're such lovable creatures. Uh, John, uh, anything else that you wrote that you want to uh, celebrate? All of it. It was, it was brilliant. I'm a genius. All say? right. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I think if I was to highlight one thing that I actually quite liked was the the idea of the oblique um, just being like, <laughs> I just remember sitting there thinking, right, so we've got this kind of fish and that kind of fish and crabs and frogs and all sorts of stuff. Like, what have we not got? Uh, and, sat, and then I just went, how about just water, you know? <laughs> Yeah, because we've got some art from that as well. Again, another Larry piece. It's the puddles people are just sinking into uh, yeah, out, of, out of nowhere. But the, the whole the whole notion of that that, that that's actually your wife, you know, <laughs> it's coming after you to, to some extent or another, um, or a part of her, or what's left of her is, is chasing you down the street, going, "Come back, love me," you know. Um, <laughs> it, it's sort of like. To me, that was the whole nature of the thing, was like horrifying and funny at the same time, and you don't know which one to feel, and you can kind of choose, you know, um, and you can make it either. Um, so Michel wants to know if uh, we personally had to deal with one of the monsters in the book, which one would I be the most scared of? Which one would you all be the most scared of? Uh, I'm not going to say brainy to eels. I'll reserve that for one of you, uh, although obviously any kind of body snatcher alien is quite terrifying. I think the very um, size of Centipus, the way Centipus is described, and the gargantuan squid. Uh, we've got a couple of mega monsters. I saw Keegan ask about that uh, in the comments too. We've got several giant monsters in this, and the scale system in Story Path works very well for conveying that. But Centipus is, as the name implies, a hundred tentacled octopus. Uh, I know that defeats the name uh, immediately, but if it is the size that it is implied to be, and you were in a city and looking out to sea, Centipus would basically take up the horizon. And I think that would be fairly terrifying. You know, you think a tsunami is bad if Centipus is roiling towards the city or um, <laughs> you're going to want to run in the opposite direction as fast as you can. Uh, Larry, any particular monsters you wouldn't want to uh, be faced with or want to wake any up next to? Yeah, as I was uh, going through the threats that people were coming up with, I, I, I find that there were several parasitic ones, and I think 
you know, uh, anything, anything parasitic is just, uh, you know, that's pretty, that's pretty creepy. That's pretty scary. So. Bianca. Uh, like anything that is humongous or like parasite when you know that you're like dying, I feel is the most like, that's actually like horror. Mm. Um, but like, if you think about it, all of them are scary. Oh in yeah. In a way, or the or, or the other, it's just some might kill you before you kind of like process, like, hey, what? Did I did did I die? Was that a <laughs> guy in a suit? Yeah, what? exactly. Well, I think that's what I enjoy about the giant pill bugs. Uh, they are, on the face of it, not terribly frightening. But then, if you realise they're giant pill bugs, uh, that that's not the kind of thing humans are meant to be facing. And I can easily see a creature like that being uh, photographed, well, uh, recorded, blown up, and put into a uh, Harryhausen-style movie. You know, the, 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 these pill bugs are just pill bugs. Of course they are. But they are somehow large enough to dominate the screen. And you've got, ah, a small man. Like in Larry's trailer for the game, in fact, with <laughs> our uh, giant lobster creatures. Um, and John? What what are you scared of that comes from the water? Um, it, the, it doesn't come from the water, I don't think. Well, I suppose their directives do to some extent, but F-I-S-H, fish, um, scare the hell out of me. I work, I work in local government. I know these people, you know. Um, like, I've sat down at meetings with these guys, these true believers uh, that, that, that almost convince you, you know. <laughs> they're, they're talking to you about these things, and you're sitting there going... Oh, that, that's uh, I suppose that sounds feasible, you know. Like, oh, yeah. they're, they're actually they're actually not that bad. And then the next thing you know, they're destroying the countryside. Um, it's like the most insidious threat of all, isn't it? Like the whole idea that maybe we could just talk to them and make peace with them and all of that. Like, um, <laughs> but that's it's also the most nineteen fifties thing, right? Isn't it? It's like you know, the last thing we need to do is is make peace. Is it's, it's actually sit down and talk to anyone? Like, no, we have to. To crush the bad, there are bad things and good things, and we have to kill the bad things because we are the good things naturally. Um, exactly. But the, the 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 insidious thing about fish, I guess, is that they believe that too. So, and they really believe it. So, yes, you you wouldn't know they were coming. That be the worst thing about them. Uh, Dixie wants to know what's the funniest anecdote, line, or quip from playtesting or convention games. Uh, I I'm going to answer this, and we'll move straight on because my favourite one is Alabama in capitals. Uh, so part of the quip system is players can make up their own quips as well and uh, basically deal them into the deck. And if they get drawn out by a player, that's a quip they're stuck with until they use it. And there was one that was just Alabama, uh, which was used to great effect, where they're charging into battle, running away from battle. Uh, <laughs> It's amazing the versatility of proclaiming Alabama loudly. So uh, I recommend it. Uh, Hexfiles <laughs> says, is this more classic B movie or like the Italian money laundering nonsense movies? I'm a big fan of Italian Jallo, uh, Jallo movies, uh, non exploitation movies. So you hold your tongue, Hexfile. I they have a bad word said about nude for Satan. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> they came from beneath the convent, will be the next game. They came from beneath the wimple. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, you could make a sequel inspired by Grindhouse Cinema, says David. We could indeed. It is quite possible. Uh, so let's see. Do we have any other questions? I know we're running short on time. Only three minutes left. Let's see if I can find a question. A good one. Not that any of your questions are bad. Oh, thank you, cynical pleb, for saying I. Uh, that that's this person's name. I'm not 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 just calling them a cynical pleb. Thank you, you cynical pleb, for telling me I inspired you to uh, transition into RPGs. That's lovely to know. Uh, Hexfile says, "Was the Dying Earth RPG a big influence for the quip mechanic?" I can't say it was actually, uh, but that's a good good question. I think I may have played Dying Earth once, and I don't even remember a quip mechanic in it. Um. And we've just hit 40,000, uh, which means we we get a greater art budget. So fantastic. This Q&A is drawing people to the Kickstarter. Congratulations, all of us. Nice. Uh, yeah, because, Larry, hopefully that means we'll be able to hire you. Oh, so. well. <laughs> well done, Larry, you get paid, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were holding on to your money. Uh, <laughs> 
uh, cynical player also asks if you could go back in time what would you do differently with this game nothing uh, I mean I wouldn't have spent 10 years play testing it in different genres with different levels of seriousness I suppose but it's all part of the process as I mentioned at the beginning this is the first game I have delivered from concept to page um, I've worked on plenty of RPGs but none of them have been my idea and from the point I uh, sold the IP to uh, Rich Thomas and we started producing this, it's been a dream come true to work on it. So I wouldn't change anything to do with this. I'm very happy with the finished product. Um, Gary Jeffrey says a were shrimp is scarier than Nosferatu. So that's, uh, <laughs> I suppose, yeah, seeing a human sized shrimp, shrimp aren't the most beautiful of uh, creatures, are they? What else do we have? Is there a mechanic for directors to create their own threats? Asks Frank Morrison. This is something we weren't able to fit in the core book. It was in an earlier draft. I wrote it, uh, a threat creation system, so for your monsters. But given we have funded additional threat files with Kickstarter, I think you will see it in one of those books. That's certainly my intention. Um, so people can start making their own monsters up. It's a very simple system. How do you defeat Centipus, says Frank Morrison. Um, you have to get inside it, if I recall. Isn't that right, John? You wrote um, how to defeat Centipus, and it yeah. wasn't even how to defeat it. It was more how to escape its gullet. Centipus has a special rule. I believe it's called It's Huge, um, which means that pretty much any weapons you have just bounce off of it. The only way to kill it is to get inside, and then you will find a whole new world of horror waiting for you in there, which I won't describe. Okay. Including a cult. I think there's a cult in there, isn't yeah, there? Yeah, but basically there are many things that Centipus eats, and a lot of them are in there, and some of them have gone mad from starvation and consuming each other in various guises, and have formed a, a cult called the Children of the Tentacle. Mm. They worship it and defend it from within, so you have to overcome them. It's many natural defences, and some of the other aliens which it's been eaten on its path through the sea as well. Well, we have reached the hour mark, which means we're going to have to call an end to our Q&A. And I've got to thank everyone who tuned in to watch. I've got to thank everyone who has backed the Kickstarter. We've still got a couple of days left, so uh, feel free to up your pledge. Buy another copy. Buy one for your friend. Buy one for your mother. She'll appreciate it. But um, I also have to thank my three co-hosts here. I know some of this has felt a bit rushed. Again, apologies for it going on the wrong channel but I'm very grateful for them uh, giving us their time to talk about this game. Uh, so thank you very much, all three of you. And do you have any parting words for the fans, uh, Bianca? When you're oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would probably say don't underestimate how versatile the game is. So it's really fun, and you can create a lot of fun stuff with it. Give us your money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, give us your money. And uh, that, that was the important takeaway there. Uh, <laughs> John, anything you want to say? Uh, they Came From Beneath the Sea is probably the purest expression of game that I've worked on. It is the most fun you can have in the water or without the water. Um, so enjoy it because we enjoyed it. And Larry? I'd like to just say... Keep watching the oceans. That's it. Boating. <laughs> he does this every time. Every <laughs> Well, and again, thank you very much, viewers. Thank you very much, backers. And uh, last thing I want to say is thank you to everyone who's watched this, who has supported me on this channel, me on the, my various writing development projects. It has, I'm very grateful for your continued support and hopefully I will continue to earn that from you. So thank you very much for watching. <laughs>